Japan's discreet but deliberate entry into Europe's long-range strike ecosystem could signal a turning point in how democracies share high-end weapons technology under mounting geopolitical pressure. According to people familiar with ongoing defense industry contacts, Kawasaki Heavy Industries and Germany's Taurus Systems GmbH have engaged in structured exploratory talks over turbofan engine technology that could, if carried forward, reshape the next generation of European air-launched cruise missiles. The initiative is not a public joint program, not a procurement contract and not yet a binding exchange of technology. Its significance lies instead in what it implies. Europe is openly preparing alternatives to U.S. propulsion for its top-end strike weapons while Japan is testing how far it can stretch its export control doctrine without legislatively rewriting it. Reuters first broke the existence of a Memorandum of Understanding signed during the DSEI Japan 2025 exhibition in Tokyo, where Taurus, partly owned by MBDA, signaled concrete interest in Kawasaki's compact turbofan currently under development for Japan's next anti-ship cruise missile architecture. The Japanese engine, described by technical sources as smaller, lighter and more fuel-efficient than the American Williams International Unit currently integrated in the Taurus KEPD 350 series, offers a direct lever on range, payload options and integration flexibility. These are not marginal gains, in the standoff strike economy, an extra 20 to 30 percent of range can change the survivability math for an entire campaign. Engine substitution is not a routine decision. A cruise missile is a tightly integrated system where geometry, fuel balance, guidance, thermal signature, and airframe loads are co optimized around propulsion. Swapping out a US built core for a Japanese unit means redesign cost, requalification workload potential recertification of safety for carriage on Tornado or F-15, and, perhaps most importantly, a political statement that Europe is no longer willing to anchor critical strike performance to a non-European supplier. For Taurus and the governments behind it, propulsion diversification is at once a technical hedge and a sovereignty hedge. Japan's role in this equation is more delicate. Tokyo's three principles on transfer of defense equipment and technology are engineered to stop exactly this category of exports, elements that enable offensive power projection. That is why interlocutors stress that outright engine export is improbable under today's interpretation. The MOU instead frames joint development, co-design, or controlled integration work as the plausible channel, work that happens inside Japan or under bilateral scrutiny so that the transfer is not characterized legally as an export of a complete weapon subsystem. This legal threading is not cosmetic. Any misstep would detonate domestic political backlash and reignite the long-running debate over whether Japan is drifting away from its pacifist guardrails. The timing of European interest is not accidental. Germany is under mounting political pressure over the Taurus missile in the context of Ukraine. Chancellor Friedrich Merz has backed the transfer of Taurus to Kiev, an idea Moscow has publicly labeled as equivalent to direct German participation in the war. Simultaneously Berlin plans to move forward with parliamentary approval of dozens of defense programs, including modernization of the Taurus line and procurement of Taurus Neo, a projected fleet of roughly 600 missiles for deliveries in the late 2020s. Spain and South Korea, existing Taurus operators, are natural downstream beneficiaries of any performance uplift or supply chain insulation achieved through a Japanese engine. Behind the bilateral headlines sits a wider swing in Western defense posture. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and China's rapid military acceleration have turned standoff precision strike into a currency of deterrence. The United States dominates that technology category and has historically exported propulsion and guidance elements selectively. Europe's scramble to erect autonomous alternatives is not industrial vanity, it is the recognition that in a war-lengthened world, America's industrial bandwidth and political availability cannot be assumed as a constant. If Washington slows approvals or prioritizes its own stocks, Europe risks capability paralysis. The Taurus-Kawasaki channel is one of several hedges now being assembled. For Japan, the calculus is different but parallel. 
The island state is rearming for a high-end contingency with China while still wearing formal anti-export armor written for a very different era. Joint development is fast becoming the loophole that eats the rule, a way to not export, while still embedding Japanese workshare in systems that will live and operate abroad. Participation in a European strike weapon, even via propulsion co-design, would be a symbolic break from the past, Japan as a net supplier of offensive effect, not just a guarded consumer behind walls. None of this is assured. The MOU is a point of entry, not an executed roadmap. Governments could block, slow, or dilute cooperation. Public scrutiny could spike if the Ukraine tourist debate reaches a new crisis threshold. MBDA, ATLA, and Kawasaki have all declined comment or signaled that all decisions remain subordinate to export control review. Yet the existence of the agreement matters precisely because it was signed at all, under the eye of regulators and amid the most rigid export climate Japan has had in decades. Every technical fact in the open source stream points to why Taurus would push forward. The current KEPD 350 already outranges many Western peers at more than 500 kilometers. A lighter, hotter, more efficient engine is how you add another ring of reach without rewriting the airframe. In a European battlefield geometry defined by Russian S-400 and follow-on air defenses, each added kilometer of standoff is a risk delta in lives, aircraft, and escalation. For Seoul and Madrid, that same math applies against different adversaries on different maps. The engine is the multiplier. If joint development advances, years of integration and flight testing would follow before any Japanese DNA appears in an operational Taurus round. That long timeline is another signal, Europe is planning for contestation that is measured not in months but in strategic decades. A strike weapon delivered in 2029 is not about Ukraine 2025, it is about the shape of deterrence in the 2030s, when Russia will still exist, China will be stronger, and the United States may be less globally available. The most consequential part of this emerging story may be what it normalizes. If Japan can co-develop propulsion for a European cruise missile without triggering political collapse at home, the red line around offensive technology sharing becomes blur, not wall. Other partners may then seek Japanese censors, seekers, or guidance stacks under the same legal construct. In parallel, Europe could begin structuring more of its long-range portfolio around mixed heritage components that reduce single-nation reliance and regulatory choke points. The psychological barrier to cross-continental co-production of strike assets would fall. Official silence will likely persist until a formal program decision gives governments something defensible to announce. By then, the strategic meaning may already be baked in, Japan will have crossed from consumer to contributor in the global strike ecosystem, and Europe will have stepped another inch away from American propulsion umbilicals. In a war-sharpened decade, both moves are rational. The modern cruise missile is no longer just a weapon, it is a sovereign insurance policy. And insurance portfolios are never built on a single counterparty.